Okay, so this is this is our first meeting of the uh, 2023 season. Um, I'm very pleased to welcome Professor Andy Sutton. Just call him Andy because I think when you get to our age, you're allowed to call professors by their first names. It's one of the one of the benefits of being old. Uh, and he's a distinguished engineer at BT. Uh, specialises in 4G and 5G at the moment. Uh, and I was saying to him earlier, having read his CV, it's full of acronyms, as you might imagine. I think a lot of us have had a lot of acronyms that we've had to deal with over the years. And one of the great treasures of as you get old, you can start avoiding all these acronyms. But Andy's knee deep in the things, unfortunately, as well as working at, uh, at BT with a lot of modern stuff. Uh, he's also a visiting professor in telecommunications at Salford University, which is great. This is why he's a professor as well as an engineer. Um, but as well, because like a lot of us, he's come through the years. Uh, he, he does remember quite well the early days of telecommunications and particularly digital telecommunications, 2G and 3G. Uh, he actually has a Twitter um, account, um, which is 2G GSM, where he posts a load of stuff about old kit. I mean, I must say, uh, I apologize as well for most people who are used to the CCS meetings being 1940s, 50s and 60s technology. We have strayed a few decades into the future with this. But I'm sure most of you will find it interesting. It's still pretty damned old stuff as far as Andy's concerned, I think. Um, the description he's put for himself on the on the Twitter account says he does mobile communications network architect and a design engineer with an interest in the past, present and the future of telecommunications. And he's going to talk to us about some of the evolution of telecommunications. So, okay. So hopefully you can unmute now. Hopefully everybody can hear me now. Is anybody on the uh, on the video chat can you hear me as well? Yeah. Yep. Perfect. Okay. Um, well, thank you. I mean, it's absolutely great to be here. Uh, forgive me, I'll be glancing between the camera and, and, and the audience in the room here. Um, to uh, groups. Um, my talk is about the evolution of digital cellular data communications. And the reason this is of interest from a historical perspective is uh, not only am I talking about 2G and 3G, as we commonly call them, and uh, next month I'm talking at a conference about 6G, uh, but actually we are in the process now globally of switching off 2G and 3G networks. So actually as technology evolution accelerates, the time from a technology being new to a technology being old to a technology being forgotten and hang on a minute, that's heritage, I want to understand it, is very, very short. So actually collecting those records, you know, almost kind of contemporary collecting as we go along is absolutely vital if people are going to navigate the information the revolution that we're currently living through in 50 or 100 years time. You know, how did we get from 1G brick mobile phones right the way through to 5G and 6G? You know, in just that short period of time. So uh, part of my objective is to uh, try and play my part in documenting that history. So uh, let's start with a quick look at what we're going to cover today. Um, very quickly, I'll talk generally about GSM 2G, the Global System for Mobile Communications. I'll talk briefly about the network architecture and just introduce some of the network elements and talk a bit about capacity because capacity is important. Uh, I'm going to use terms like high speed data in this presentation, and it depends where you want to start in time as to what high speed is. Um, yeah, I, I'm now deploying 10 gigabits per second of fiber optic capacity into a cellular base station. You know, clearly in the days of 2G, uh, an E1 circuit, a two megabit per second circuit, was a lot of capacity, and that was shared between many, many users, of course. And obviously, going back further, yeah, that that kind of continues down. So we'll look particularly at GSM data services. And in that context, we'll speak briefly about short message service, SMS, text messaging. You know, a data service that's absolutely revolutionized the world and led to all the messaging applications we have today. We'll talk about circuit switch data and high speed circuit switch data. High speed in this context was 28.8 kilobits per second. And that was absolutely game changing at the time. And then we'll introduce a concept of packet data into this world of telephony, the world of circuits and you know, bell telephony, with GPRS, a general packet radio service, 
and then an evolution to that called enhanced data for GSM evolution. We'll then go on to talk about 3G. We'll pause briefly to catch our breath when we look at the amount of money we paid for spectrum licenses back in uh, 2000 with the 3G auction and how that effectively destroyed the industry. Uh, we'll then look at what happened with the 3G network architecture, how that differed from 2G, talk briefly about some network elements and introduce some data services from the time of 3G. The big revolutionary uh, service at the time was the ability to have a 384K connection. That was a downlink connection from the network to your device, typically 64K in the uplink from your device back to the network. And then we introduced a whole series of new technologies that we called high-speed packet access, starting with the downlink. And in mobile, we'll talk about the term downlink a lot. Uh, so from the radio base station to your device and uplink from your device back to the radio base station. We have to engineer both directions you know, independently. Um, and typically we are uplink limited in terms of connectivity and services we can deliver. We'll then talk a little bit about 2G and 3G sunsetting. You know, why is this stuff really becoming history? Um, in some places it's been turned off. If you're a 3G user today, you'll find there's very little capacity left on the 3G network. Most of the radio spectrum has been repurposed to 4G and even 5G services. And we will be switching 3G off in the UK next year. 2G will follow a few years later. And I'm going to explain why 3G is one before 2G uh, shortly. Uh, so let's jump into the actual content. Let's start with GSM, the GSM timeline. Now, whilst analog mobile phones launched in the UK in 1985, several years before that, a piece of work started to develop a pan-European mobile phone system, which ultimately became 2G, GSM, Group Special Mobile. It was a research project within the European community before the GSM was reformed to a global system for mobile communications. So that work started in 82, and then in 1988, ETSI was established, the European Telecommunications Standards Institute, with the purpose of developing that standard and the technical specifications for a pan-European cellular system. By that point, it was agreed it would be a digital system. Back in 1982, there was no such agreement. There was a lot of work done to assess analog systems, and assess digital systems, and ultimately they settled on the digital system, a narrowband digital system. The first call on a GSM network was made in 1991, and that was in the 900 megahertz frequency band. Now, interestingly, that frequency band had already been assigned in the UK and many other European countries for analog voice services. So operators like Vodafone and Cellnet, as they were called at the time, had to refarm or repurpose some of the spectrum to the new digital service while still maintaining the analog system. That caused them some real challenges in terms of spectrum reforming, as we call it in industry. The same challenges we face today as we move spectrum from 2G, 3G, 4G to 5G. You know, how much spectrum do you move and when do you move it to maximize user experience during that adoption of new handsets? And then in 1992, we saw the first data session established, a circuit switch data session established on a GSM network. And we're going to explore that, what the architecture looked like. Um, and then, of course, in 1992, we also had the first SMS, the first text message was sent. And there was a desire to build text messages into the service from the early days. But, you know, it, it just blew everybody away in terms of how this technology took off. The adoption of text messaging, it was quite remarkable. And, of course, that's led to all the messaging services that we see today. The first text message was actually sent from a PC uh, to the terminal, and it was received on an Orbitel 901 telephone, which you can see the transportable phone on the, uh, on the, on the image there. OK, so let's look at the, uh, the launch dates for GSM services. And this already highlights one of the challenges with documenting this relatively recent history. We know for a fact that Vodafone launched on the 2nd of December 1991. It was a rather soft launch. It was in reality July 92 before they started shipping in volumes because uh, quite often GSM in those days was actually, uh, again, changed to mean godsend mobiles because there was a mass shortage of mobile phones. You just could not get enough mobile phones for the limited demand at the time, let alone the way that demand would grow. Mercury 1 to 1 launched in September 1993. 
and they launched the world's first 1800 megahertz network. So twice the frequency. So it, lots of potential for capacity for a lot less coverage per base station. And we're now talking about building cellular radio interface connections at 26 and 40 gigahertz. But at the time, using 1800 megahertz to build a national mobile phone network was seen to be the maddest idea in the world. Now, you're going to need 20,000 plus base stations. No one's ever going to build that. But actually, we have. Uh, you know, it, it's took, taken time, but that's where we are now. Cellnet launched in December 1993. If anybody can tell me what date in December 1993, that would be a great contribution to historical record. Because even in BT Archive, I've struggled to find the exact date. And that highlights the problem, even with this relatively recent history. 28th of April 1994, uh, a startup company called Microtel, that had just been bought by Hutchison Telecom, launched with a company, a uh, company brand called Orange. Uh, I actually worked for Orange at the time. And Therefore, we had four operators in the UK, two of which were operating 900 megahertz, Vodafone and Cellnet, and two operating 1800 megahertz, Mercury one-to-one -one and Orange. And that particular base station in the photo there is just worth a moment. Uh, that's a three-cell sector base station, uh, but it's only got a single GSM transceiver at the bottom. So that entire site, which would have cost over £100,000 to build at the time, could support seven consecutive voice calls. That was it on that entire base station site. It gives you a feel for perspective. So you know, significantly low uh, volumes of capacity. But of course, it wasn't really going to take off, was it? Not everybody was going to have a mobile phone. It would be limited usage. Of course, the world changed. So we ended up with Vodafone, Mercury one to one, and three off peak calls after 7 p.m. That turned out to be expensive for them. Cellnet. And of course, Everyone remember the baby from the Orange launch video uh, prior to April 1994. Vodafone focused very much on the aspects of business. They've been selling to businesses predominantly with their tax devices, the analog mobile phones, and they talked a lot about the ability to roam internationally, which you couldn't do on the first generation systems, of course. Um, Mercury one to one, very much aimed at the kind of fixed market with their tariffs. Uh, Orange kind of positioned themselves fairly in the middle, uh, as did uh, Cellnet. So, rolling out network coverage, we started to see a major civil engineering program starting to build radio base stations. And as part of that program, each operator had to deploy a particular network architecture. Now, the only thing that changed between the 1800 and 900 megahertz operators was that frequency of operation, so the antennas. But also the mobile phones, because at the time, the mobile phones only operated on one frequency band. So you either had a phone at 900 megahertz or you had a phone at 1800 megahertz. It was going to be some years later before we got dual and even triple band mobile phones. And now it's quite remarkable as how many frequency bands do operate within one of these devices. So when we started to roll out the network, we had to understand this GSM network architecture. So we've got our BTSs. Now, that picture we saw before was a BTS, a base transceiver station. And those base transceiver stations connect into what we call a BSC, a base station controller. The base station controllers then connect into a unit that we call a transcoder and rated action unit. Now, the reason for that was the, the MSC, the mobile switching center behind that, was a basic telephone exchange. It was a 64 kilobit per second uh, telephone switch, same as System X and System Y were in the BT network at the time, in the PSTN, the public switch telephone network. But it also had some mobility features in there and some additional registers and databases that allowed it to authenticate users and indeed track those users so it could actually send the uh, incoming calls to a particular group of cells. But the key thing was this was all about telephony. The transcoder and rate adaption unit simply converted from the codec we used on the radio interface, it's about 12.2 kilobits per second, to that standard 64 kilobits per second, the alpha law uh, encoded telephone signal that we use on the PSTN. The rate adaption feature was in there to support data communications, as we'll see in a moment. There were many GSM network equipment vendors at the time, lots of names here that be common. Alcatel, Ericsson, Lucent, Marconi, Matra, Motorola, Nokia, Nortel, 
Orbital, Philips and Siemens uh, before the likes of Huawei and ZTE uh, launched services some years later. But of course, we've seen massive consolidation within that industry. Of all those companies now, the only two companies making base station infrastructure are Ericsson and Nokia. But here's an early example of an Ericsson base station, uh, RBS 2202, and a Nortel base station. Each of those base stations, when fully configured, would support a 2 plus 2 plus 2 base station configuration. So in each of the typical three cell sectors or three directions that we have on a base station, you would have two transceivers and allowing for signaling that would offer typically a total of 14 voice channels. So applying a 1% blocking probability to the radio, that would give you seven airlines of throughput uh, per cell sector. So again, incredibly low capacity by today's, today's requirements. But of course, there are only a small number of handsets out there. Uh, demand was minimal at the time. Um, and what would really drive demand would be that mass adoption of handsets. The voice would be the first driver, but of course, then the introduction of data communications slightly after. I mentioned the BSC, the base station controllers. Here's an example of some base station controllers sitting in, uh, in one of the core network sites and an example of the switching equipment in there as well. And these core network sites took on various physical forms. It's really interesting because in some cases, they were bespoke build, you know, with, with big signature towers that were features, such as this tower here, which was built at Tannock side uh, in, in the outskirts of Glasgow. Uh, this was actually uh, built in Germany and brought over on the back of wagons, segment by segment, and built in Glasgow. And that was a requirement to get planning permission for such a tall structure because it had to be a feature on the landscape. And at the bottom of that, there were a number of industrial units effectively where the equipment was housed. Picture on the left there, uh, a little more kind of industrial from the outset. This was a, an industrial unit that was already existing. It was taken over by one of the mobile network operators to deploy their equipment into. You can see the short tower at the back just sticking up there. Uh, that was actually in uh, on the Wirral in, in just the outskirts of Liverpool. And again, another example inside uh, that site on the left there uh, of the switching equipment uh, and transmission equipment within the building. Okay, so what do we mean by GSM data services? Um, and I purposely used the Nokia 2140 there, which was the, uh, the kind of high-end launch device that Orange used when they launched the network, because that device could support data communications. You'll see how in a moment. But what's particularly interesting, of course, is this technology was so incredibly advanced you had to have an audio cassette to tell you how to use your phone. So every single mobile phone came with an audio cassette that talked you through the process of using the phone, storing numbers in the phone, sending a short message, etc. Nowadays, we just assume we pick these devices up and they work and we know how to use them, of course. But a very, very different time, we had to really educate the users in the use of this incredibly advanced technology. So I mentioned SMS, and it's worth just spending a moment on SMS because it was effectively a data service. Um, and the reason Etsy looked at this when developing the specification was there was a commercial imperative. People were carrying pages, and alphanumeric paging was increasingly popular. But of course, along with your paging, you would carry a few 10 pence pieces for the telephone box that you would stop at when you got paged to actually phone back in and have that conversation. So actually, the adoption of an SMS service within GSM opened up a huge market. And that was really interesting in terms of the commercialization of the service because the level of investment made was absolutely vast. There had to be some confidence that there would be a return. So the GSM group collectively looked very much at that kind of market opportunity and how they could position products. So, um, there was two types of uh, SMS service specified. We take it for granted now again, both were point to point. One was mobile terminated and one was mobile originated. Now the concept of being able to send or receive a message from this device seems obvious now, but again, there was some debate given the page and legacy as to whether that was in fact necessary. And indeed it became a key feature. Of course, 160 characters was determined to be the, the maximum length of a short message service. 
Uh, later, you could concatenate multiple uh, messages together, of course, but they're all built on 160 character uh, segments. It became so popular that dedicated devices were built to support this uh, SMS data service. You see the Motorola V100 here, uh, very popular with the youth at the time uh, for high speed messaging with a QWERTY keyboard. You remember originally, of course, you would be typing, you know, you'd be pressing a button three or four times to get the right character. You went past once, you'd touch on her and start again, tapping trying to get the right character to display prior to predictive text, of course. So a really interesting start to our look at GSM data services with SMS. We then saw probably what's considered more conventional data over GSM with the introduction of the PCM CIA card form factor. Uh, this was used extensively in the early days to support up to 9.6 kilobits per second data. And that Nokia 2140 that we saw before was the first device deployed in the UK to support that. I'm using a Panasonic uh, phone in this particular photograph here. And this was a GSM 900 example, the 2140 that we saw before. That uh, was an 1800 megahertz example. Again, just one frequency band on the phone. So it was originally anticipated that a user would want to communicate with a host on the PSTN. So GSM had to support the correct 3.1K audio, of course. We're talking voice band audio here, 300 hertz to 3.4 kilohertz. And we had to create and generate those tones so we could send them out to a standard modem. So we had a lot of flexibility in GSM, which we didn't have in tax. Uh, but also we had some constraints because we weren't sending an analog channel that we could actually send the tones within. The digital codec for the voice traffic would actually corrupt those tones and they wouldn't be rec recreated at the far end. So we had to generate those tones in the network, not at the end user device. So we created a device called an IWF, an interworking function. And that IWF sat at the back of the MSC, the mobile switching center, the telephone exchange effectively for mobile. And we can see here how the data device would be subtended from the phone, we use that modem in the phone, to connect over the radio interface or the UM interface as it was known, through the BSC, through the transcoder, where we would take the two bits of data, it was a maximum 16 kilobits per second on that connection from the base station to the transcoder. We would pad it out the six bits that we wouldn't use to then make effectively an 8-bit, 64 kilobit per second time slot that we could switch. We would then discard the six bits that we popped in there and put the two bits into the interworking function. And from there, we would generate the tones and then send that out as literally audio tones in that 3.1K audio subband. So effectively, you can see the various data rates that are applicable here to achieve 9K6 uh, at the end. Now, as we evolved the system, we wanted some high speed data. And we found that actually through optimization of the radio network, we could deliver 14.4 kilobits per second in one of those 16K time slots. Now, 16K was on the transmission path. It was more like 33K on the radio interface, which had a lot more error correction, of course, on the radio interface. But within that payload, we could actually push 14.4 kilobits per second with good radio conditions. That's really important. You know, we re needed a really good radio environment to do that. We could then look at combining multiple time slots. The system specification allowed for up to ti four time slots to be uh, combined. Typically, it was only two, and I'll explain why in a moment. But actually, I had a limited number of artifacts I could bring along as I came on the train today. Uh, but I brought a 14K4 uh, video card with me here. And this supported 28.8 with two time slots aggregated. And this was actually a launch device from Orange again. Uh, and there are, there are a number of devices that had this integrated into them. And we'll, we'll see a few of those as we go through. But again, using that PCM CIA form factor. So why was it a problem to use more than two time slots? Well, what I've tried to illustrate here is that if the mobile station is receiving two slots, it then needs some time to switch to transmit. And the mobile device then needs to listen to the surrounding environment to get broadcast control channels with information about other cells in the area to understand whether it needs to do a handover, for example, it's moving from point A to point B. 
and it then needs to retune to receive again. So there's only a single receiver in a GSM device. So with two slots, you could just make it work because there are eight time slots, eight TDMA time slots on the radio interface. On a single transceiver, typically time slot zero would be used for control signals and one to seven, uh, sorry, one to eight would be used to carry user information. If you've got more than one transceiver, then time slots zero and one on the first transceiver would be used and then six time slots for data and all eight time slots on the next transceiver would be used for data. So you can see how congested it gets within that TDMA frame structure. The way around this is to put a second receiver into the device and have a second receiver there for the purpose of monitoring. But actually by doing that, you increase the cost of the device considerably. And uh, whilst there was some experimentation done with that, I'm not aware of anybody launching a four slot commercial service. In fact, in the UK, Orange were the only people to launch a two slot service. And that's one of the advantages of 1800 megahertz over 900. There was more spectrum available, more capacity available that allowed some of these early data services to come to market. So here's an example of a high speed circuit switch data card from an MSC. This had that interworking function integrated into it, so it generated those audio tones. And we'll all remember some of these specifications. And here's an example of a orange video phone in which the data communication was actually the integration of this device physically integrated into the back of that video phone. It wasn't the best video phone in the world. It cost about a thousand pounds. The codec was developed by the University of Strathclyde and it did remarkably well considering it operated at 28.8 kilobits per second at the time. You know, it was a proof of concept. And it was actually the, the forerunner of what became the SPV, sound picture vision range of phones that Orange sold successfully for many, many years, working in partnership with uh, HTC and much of the suppliers. So WAP, Frankie, wireless application protocol. The internet stuff's not going to work on these mobile networks. We need to develop our own protocol. And at the time, it was not only the idea that we needed to optimize the protocol for mobile networks, why would anybody ever want to go to the internet on a mobile phone? It was never even considered. You, know, you would go to a walled garden within the network operator's domain, and they may port some news in from the BBC. They may port a bit of uh, travel information in, for example. But you would actually consume services from the operator. So again, at the time, the internet wasn't what the internet is today. So a very different kind of mindset. So uh, what was developed between Nokia, Ericsson, and Motorola? Um, and Orange launched the 7110 towards the end of 1999. This was the first WAP phone, and this is a device here. But this device, again, operated on circuit switching. It wasn't packet switched at this time. It was a circuit switch device used to high-speed circuit switch data, a single time slot to access the service. Also, of course, WAP led to a lot of confusion in subscribers. A lot of people. Uh, followed the advertisement from Cellnet that said, surf the BT Cellnet, as they became then, and actually expected to get a similar experience on their mobile phone to that they got on the early uh, internet with dial-up connectivity. And of course, it was very, very different. Um, and that actually got, uh, got BT Cellnet into some trouble with the, uh, the regulator at the time as well. So, we need to manage growth, of course. I've mentioned how little capacity is in these base station sites, and we're now starting to see data traffic grow. So how do we actually manage data growth? Well, you can see here an example of mobile connections in the UK. And if you notice at the bottom there, you know, very, very low numbers. Uh, that starts in 1987. You can see uh, the early 90s, we started to see growth in the adoption of analog mobile phones, and then the introduction of mass market mobile connectivity when Mercury one to one and Orange came to market and drove this whole new consumer interest. But also the additional competition, of course, drove price down considerably. And you can see that big kick that occurred there towards the mid to late 1990s uh, in terms of handset adoption, and then the growth continued. By the time we get to the end of this chart, you know, there are more mobile phones than there are people in the UK, because a lot of people would, by that point, have two mobile phones, one for work and one for their own private use. 
to manage that growth, we started to deploy small cells or microcells, as they were called. Here's an example of a microcell. The picture with the door open was taken not long, long after it was deployed. That is a one TRX Nokia Prime site base station. So that adds a total of seven voice channels, each effectively supporting up to 16 kilobits per second uh, of backhaul connectivity. So huge investment for a small amount of capacity. But again, it was relative at the time. It was actually a significant uplift in that local area. And you can see the column there. The column, the photograph of the actual base station cabinet um, with the graffiti on the front, I took just a few months ago. It's not operational now, but it's still actually in situ. Uh, so yeah, a bit of a industrial archaeology there for us as well. So introducing GPRS, general packet radio service now, and this concept of always on connectivity. In theory, GSM uh, with GPRS could support up to 171.2 kilobits per second. I should probably have put the theory in capital letters, underlined it and made it bold because you certainly were not achieving anything like that on these networks at the time. But nonetheless, it was an interesting concept and you would actually build on data volume as opposed to being billed on connectivity time, which you were with circuit switch data, of course, because you held the circuit for the duration of your connection in the same way as you did with your dialed up modem. So we've got this new concept now that introduced coding schemes, CS1 to 4. So different depth of code, independent on the radio condition, meant you could achieve anything from nine, right the way up to 21.4 kilobits per second. Now, most operators only launched coding schemes one and two and only supported it on a small number of time slots at the time. But as time evolved, of course, the systems got better and GPRS drove a new network architecture. So I mentioned it was IP based. So we're now not talking about circuits. We're introducing some new network nodes, a packet control unit, a serving GPRS support unit and a gateway GPRS support unit. Now, for those familiar with 3G architecture, not dissimilar, we just changed some of the terminology and the interface definitions. 4G, we drop circuit switching completely and become all packet. So we see the whole world move. So now we've got this IP network sitting within the mobile network operator's core. That was a really interesting time because we were all radio and telephone people. Uh, and now we've got this IP network in an internet. When we built our first internet connectivity to support this network, we thought we'd be clever and put dual connections in for resilience reasons. So we put two times E1 circuit to the internet. So two, two megabit per second circuits. And that was sufficient capacity for the launch of this GPRS network. Now, we look at the E network as an example. Traffic on the EE network peaks at 1.1 terabits per second per day at the moment. So again. Yeah. Ter that, that, no, no, I'd, I'd be talking about bytes if I was talking about a volume of data per day. So terabits is the peak time a, and then the maximum peak we get in a given day is 1.1 terabits per second. We can, obviously, the volume of data we carry in bytes is significant over that period of time. Yeah. Uh, right. So I mentioned the new units that we introduced with GPRS, packet control unit. Thank you. Serving GPRS support unit and the gateway GPRS support unit. The initial form factor for these devices, again, was this PCM CIA card. And the photograph you can see there is an Ericsson uh, SGSN, serving GPRS support node. And then the packet control unit was integrated into the actual base station controller. So we would integrate an N plus one model. And interestingly, what that packet control unit did, as well as aggregate local traffic, it provided a frame relay connection. So this was narrow band ISDN at the time, the frame relay connection back into the core network, into this SGSN. Now this serving GPRS support node connected to the gateway GPRS support node, the very early gateway GPRS support node at the top there. This was from a startup company called Watercode. And for those with really good eyes, you might just notice the ribbon cable coming out the top. Uh, that was an emergency uh, fix to a particular problem when we launched the service originally. So all of a sudden this little ribbon cable coming out that allowed us to reset various things within the module. 
So again, really early days of building these, these data circuits. Uh, both supported similar functions to the circuit switched equivalent node, the MSC and the MSC gateway node, in terms of providing connectivity, authenticating users, providing billing interfaces, etc. But of course, we had to count the number of packets per subscriber as well. That was really important because we we're going to bill on data volume. So GPRS devices. The first set of devices I mentioned, you know, were this PCMCIA form factor. Uh, the one at the bottom there, the option GPRS data card, is the first data card I got issued. I was really excited. I've worked on GPRS for years. Couldn't wait to get my hands on it. Popped in my PC. My God, it was lousy. Went straight back into my PC bag, got my high-speed circuit switch data card back out and put that in instead. Because if I got 28.8 kilobits per second on this two time slots, they were mine, all mine. <laughs> there was no statistical multiplexing. There was no sharing of them. I could guarantee that data rate. The capacity in early GPRS networks was quite challenging, particularly as the service started to take off. So it took a little while, probably 12 months, before I confidently switched back to that GPRS card and there was enough capacity in networks then uh, to uh, support the use cases. An early example of a GPRS device was the BlackBerry. It's a 5820. Um, so BlackBerry really hit on the, uh, the market for mobile data and secure and fully integrated email on the move. I was a BlackBerry user for many, many years. And it was amazing because I could be sat there in my desktop laptop, in my desktop PC, sorry, at the time, and an email would get to my BlackBerry before it appeared on my desktop. Now, it was a remarkably efficient and fully optimized solution. Early mobile phones with GPRS included the Ericsson R520M and Motorola's TimePort T260. You see here, again, they came with whole suites of software typically provided on a CD uh, that you would load onto your PC to operate the various uh, systems on the device. BlackBerry's worth a few more words. Here's another couple of examples of BlackBerry here. You know, it really did exploit GPRS to deliver that push email service. Uh, it was fully integrated with the kind of back office systems within corporates. Um, they used a proprietary compression technique and it was also encrypted. So it was actually really popular. I mean, you would have heard, I'm sure, stories of uh, the challenges they had removing uh, President Obama's BlackBerry. When he became president, of course, he, he was so attached to it, uh, but the, uh, they didn't want him to use it for security reasons. But it becomes such a part of his, uh, his kind of business toolkit, effectively. But later, BBM, BlackBerry Messaging, became huge. And actually, the BlackBerry, a mainstream business device, became the hottest thing for kids to have. You know, it became a consumer device. And BlackBerry share price just went through the roof. You know, absolutely huge. Now, interestingly, the BlackBerry 8700 there was the first Edge device, the first Edge-based BlackBerry. Now, Edge, we touched on earlier, enhanced data for GSM evolution, was an interesting technology that increased the data rate. I'll come back to that after this one slide. But what I want to stress here is that the first iPhone, even though it was released in the days of 3G, was only a 2G device. And that was because Steve Jobs was adamant he wanted a good user experience. And 3G was patchy. It only existed in some areas. Not every network had rolled it out at that point. So actually, the best user experience would be 2G GSM with GPRS and Edge support, because that was rolled out over wide areas. So it's quite surprising that this iPhone launched with a 2G device. Of course, the second device was, uh, was 3G. So looking at GPRS coding schemes, I mentioned most operators only launch with coding schemes one and two. You can see why here. Um, the various circles here show the relative coverage of GSM. Now, the rate of coding scheme one allowed for more coding than we had on a typical voice channel. So therefore, you get slightly better coverage. Coding scheme two, you had a little less coding, so you had slightly less coverage. Uh, but they were kind of fairly relative to what you achieved with voice. So it's a very comparable service. As you stripped away that kind of coding to get more data through the time slot with coding schemes three and four, then we had some major problems in terms of the cells shrinking effectively, which is why those coding schemes weren't that common. Now, enhanced data rates for GSM evolution. 
was an answer to, or one answer to the data crunch. The data was really taken off. How could we get more capacity into networks? Now, in most networks, Edge and Evolution to 2G was launched after 3G launched. So that's interesting, the two technologies coexisted. And originally 3G was considered just to be a capacity uplift in urban areas. Originally there was talk of not deploying it nationally because you had GSM Edge deployed nationally. So you didn't necessarily need 3G everywhere as well. So mindsets have changed a lot about how these technologies are deployed and used. We introduced um, some new, what we call modulation and coding schemes. So in GPRS, everything just used Gaussian minimum shift keying. We just change the code in depth, get different amounts of throughput on a given channel. In Edge, we introduced a new modulation scheme. It was a variant of 8PSK. And it's a rather strange variant. So we can see 8PSK modulation on the first picture here. And then to the right of that, we see the Edge variant. A 3 pi by 8 radian counterclockwise rotating 8PSK. Gosh, that's a mouthful, isn't it? So between each bit transition, we got a 67.5 degree counterclockwise rotation. And that was done to try and avoid the amplifier decreasing to zero and then having to rebuild itself 180 degrees out of phase. Again, trying to maximize battery life and minimize the cost of amplifiers. I'm not sure it really achieved um, the requirement of minimizing cost because they were bespoke amplifiers to support this technology. And you'll see in a moment, we, we ended up going to more traditional uh, techniques with 3G anyway. So we've now got this variation of modulation, GMSK in poor radio conditions, 8PSK in good radio conditions, plus a variation in coding depth. So we could deliver three bits now for each symbol transition, rather than one bit that we could do with GMSK. We're starting to increase the data rate quite significantly. So if we summarize GPRS and edge performance, as you move away from the cell, if we assume the line in the middle is the cell site, then you can see how that modulation and coding scheme reduces. And you can see a relative comparison to the coding schemes of GPRS on one side and edge on the other. So the further you can get away from the cell, the lower your data rate's going to be. And that's not changed. We still have that problem today. Um, despite the kind of clever techniques we use to try and mitigate it, it's still an issue today that we're working on in 5G evolution and indeed in 6G. So all of this network was connected by two megabit per second circuits. So the number of two megabit per second circuits on base stations were increasing you know, from one to two to three to four. Uh, and we were really struggling to manage capacity. So what came along next, of course, was 3G. Now, the idea of 3G was, rather than being voice-centric, with the data added on, we'll build a network that is, in fact, data-centric. But, of course, we'll support voice as well for those who, who, who want to make voice calls. The Nokia 6650 that you see here was a test phone used by most operators in the UK when they built out the network. The uh, Nokia 7600 was Nokia's flagship device. So this is the future. It's the data device. It's designed in such a way that you operate it you know, as a handheld terminal. So really interested. And it was launched and it was kind of successful at the time. So, but the reality was the better performance from 3G came on data cards. And again, PCM CIA type data cards. This is an example of the data card that Orange launched with originally. And uh, again, you get the CD, the various package. And that data card would support 384 kilobits per second down. 64 kilobits per second up. Yes, indeed, absolutely. Um, there's a data card as well. Okay, so um, I mentioned UMTS and the 3G auction. Uh, I was closely involved with this and were amazed <laughs> that we just kept going. Um, as an industry, you know, over 22 billion pounds were spent on spectrum licenses on pieces of paper to allow you to radiate in a small block of spectrum. And you can look at this one of two ways. Yeah. Looking at it historically is really, really important because the government made 22 and a half billion pounds. 22 and a half billion pounds. Now that would buy 
a, a lot of hospitals. That will build a lot of hospitals. That will pay a lot of doctors and nurses. That will pay for a lot of capital infrastructure projects. Yes, indeed. Yes, absolutely. <laughs> Completely. Uh, but actually, looking at it from another way, the industry lost £22.5 billion. Pounds. So what happened the following week? Training budget was scrapped. A lot of training companies went out of business. Rollout programs were delayed. Upgrades to GSM were cancelled to de deliver a minimal viable product in the 3G networks. So was it a good thing? Was it a bad thing? You know, I, I think it's an interesting one to discuss. Um, certainly, we've never had an auction that's been anywhere near that kind of level since. Um, and actually, as auctions go by, then each one has been more sensibly priced and actually has come in more aligned with the operator's expectation from the modeling. Uh, and therefore, there has been budget to roll out 4G and 5G. And the rollout of 4G and 5G has been a lot quicker post-auction of the suitable spectrum than the rollout of 3G ever was. 3G auctions set into motion a number of major events. BT was about to go bust. It was financially uh, ruined and it sold its mobile business to Telefonica, hence the change from BT Cellnet to what we now know as O2. It was uh, a trigger for a new entrant. We see at the top there a company called TIW, which is actually Hutchison 3G. Um, they entered the market but couldn't afford to build the network always struggled to build, to roll out, and ultimately formed a joint venture with T-Mobile, who equally were struggling, the two smallest operators in the UK at the time. And they merged and formed a joint venture called MBNL, Mobile Broadband Networks Limited, that, that rolled out a network known as MORAN, multi-operator RAN, where they shared base stations and they shared radio network controllers. Of course, that led to further developments where T-Mobile merged with Orange, forming EE, and Vodafone and now O2 formed a joint venture called Cornerstone to again share active infrastructure. So it's fundamentally shaped the industry that we work in today. The UMTS network architecture looks very similar in many ways to that 2G GSM with GPRS architecture. We've got a new interface now called the IUR that connects the radio network controllers together, the equivalent of a BSC architecturally. But we just changed the way we manage mobility a little bit, which is why we put that interface in place. But we still got a circuit switch domain and a packet switch domain. The base station we call the node B. It was a rather strange name here, node B. Now, in the standards work, there was a node A. The node A was an ATM cross connect. But actually, the node A was integrated into the node B, the base station, as part of the physical realization. And it just become known as node B. And that term's kind of stuck now because in 4G, we refer to the base station as an evolved node B. In 5G, we refer to it as a G node B, next generation node B. So that term node B has stuck in industry, but it's basically a base station. Now we used a, a rather complex technology at the time called WCDMA, Wideband Code Division Multiple Access. Uh, so a very different technology to that that we use on the radio interface in our 2G network. Uh, but the introduction of ATM was really interesting here now. We've moved from frame relay in a narrow band technology to ATM as a broadband technology. Of course, we still built that on E1s, but we used a technology called IMA, inverse multiplexing of ATM, to build up to 16 megabit per second connections to base stations over AT1s. So it was all still PDH and SDH based as we scaled capacity in the network. We evolved to IP technology in 2002, or at least 2002 is when the standard was written, IP transport. And then for some years later, we started to see that evolution. We now use IP throughout the network, and the IP is typically now carried on carrier Ethernet. We often just refer to it as Ethernet, but it's very different to your land-based Ethernet, albeit it looks awfully similar. Just an example of an RNC and a feel for the capacity, even in the days of 3G. A configuration one RNC in the network would have 16 STM1 connections and 64 E1s, 
So you're still connecting E1s into that platform at the time. The number of E1 interfaces grew to hundreds and hundreds of thousands. It became unmanageable, to be honest with you. So prior to the move to IP, we started carrying E1s over Ethernet circuits using circuit emulation techniques so we could at least minimize the number of low speed interfaces we had to manage as we scale the data communications network. So UMTS data services, uh, here's an example of a launch device from three. Three launched the first UMTS network in the UK on the 3rd of the 3rd, 03. So they had one chance to get that right. Um, and they actually couldn't deliver a service at that time, but you could pre-order a mobile phone, but they could do the launch event. And they lit uh, Big Ben up with a big three, it's quite an effective uh, image. Um, and the device here shows you the kind of expected market. You know, data comms is very data centric. It's got video cameras, video calling, video telephony was expected to be the killer application for 3G. Of course, that never really take, really took off at the time. But again, it's a massive application now, of course, with the messaging services and video and uh, voice calling services we have on social media. So again, back to the old PCMCIA card that we mentioned. We saw that one, the orange launch here, supporting 384K. Now, T-Mobile did something interesting at the time. They were trying to cost effectively manage the volume of data on their network. They had high concentrations of users in urban areas, particularly in London. So that's where they focused their free call offer and their network in the early days. And they were struggling for capacity. So they launched a T-Mobile hotspot. So one of the first people to start putting public access Wi-Fi out on the streets, in ca cafes, in motorway services, etc. And their data card supported Wi-Fi. So they could move you onto the Wi-Fi service if it was available. We're starting to see the early steps of the integration of Wi-Fi and cellular technology, something that we've seen several iterations of since. And of course, now with voice over Wi-Fi, you can do Wi-Fi calling on a typical smartphone. But the big change came with HSDPA, High Speed Downlink Packet Access. So a 3G channel runs at 240 kilosymbols per second. And when we launched the service, it launched a QPSK, quadruple key in. <clears throat> so you know, we, we were limited to 480 kilobits per second within a given channel at the time. But actually, the innovation that came with HSDPA was the introduction of 16 QAM, 16 uh, point quadrature amplitude modulation. So we could now support four bits rather than two bits per symbol. So that gives us a massive increase in capacity. So we, we could then increase that symbol rate <coughs> to 960, oh, sorry, the, the bit rate with that given symbol rate to 960 kilobits per second. Because it was code division multiple access, we could aggregate a number of codes together. Of course, that would take a lot of capacity from the cell. So the practical realization, again, is always less than these uh, theoretical figures. But theoretically, you know, 240 times the four bits per symbol times 15 codes with a spreading factor of 16, so you couldn't use the 16 for the three control channels were, gave us our 14.4 uh, megabits per second data rate that we could achieve on HSDPA. So yeah, massive step forward from where we were with GSM, but also with, with the early 3G data systems. How did it roll out? <clears throat> well, we can see here the speed at which it rolled out to urban areas. This is an example from Orange. It's, it's, it's uh, real network plots uh, in December 07 and then looking at December 08. Now, the reason this happened so quickly was in many cases, it was just a software upgrade. You know, the hardware could support the capability. So it was software licensing. Software licensing was rolled out. This wasn't 14.4 at the time. Uh, this, this coverage diagram was 7.2 uh, because the actual realization of the feature despite the standards coming in at 14.4 megabits per second, was through a number of sub-rate steps. We started at 1.8, 3.6, 7.2, and 14.4 as the service rolled out. And I've actually got a, a high-speed, uh, sorry, uh, yeah, high-speed down at packet access dongle here from the days of Dongle Mania. Uh, this is a device that was issued by T-Mobile. And it says in the back here, enabled for HSDPA speeds, of up to 7.2 megabits per second and HSUPA uplink packet access of 5.76 megabits per second. 
So we started to enhance the uplink as well as the downlink. So, what's that crisis here? Okay, so uh, if we go on to the next slide, then Dongle Mania really drove phenomenal growth. Dongle Mania is what we refer to as the mass adoption of these USB dongles by the youth sector predominantly. So moving from SMS to BlackBerry, the youth audience then moved to laptops and laptops with data cards, primarily data dongles in this particular case. So again, these tariffs became lower and lower in price. It was no longer the preserve of business customers. They were used extensively for, uh, for just general kind of communication. And of course, internet access had become commonplace by this point. So we saw massive growth in data. Little advert there, how clear it is uh, from Orange, but basically you're yeah, selling uh, an add-on tariff for 15 pounds per month to give you data access by one of these dongles. So HSPA enhancements continued through what we call 3GPP, the third generation partnership project, which was a consortium of uh, the regional telecommunications standardization authority, so ETSI in Europe, that came together to work on the 3G standards and then became the default uh, body for mobile standardization. The release five, release six, and release seven of the standards came in 2002, four and seven respectively. And you can see the changes it made to high-speed packet access there. We also introduced MIMO antenna systems. They weren't extensively deployed, but multiple input, multiple output systems, and also 64 QAM. So again, a higher order modulation scheme now with six bits per symbol. With HSPA Plus, we could also support dual cell, and aggregate two five megahertz carriers together to increase the data rate still further. So theoretically, you know, we had huge amounts of capacity, but the reality is mobile operators typically only had two or three five megahertz carriers to deploy, and that constrained the total system capacity they could deploy. So the reality is by the time we launched 4G, certainly in London it, and major cities like Manchester, Liverpool, etc., it was impossible at peak time to actually even connect to social media. Now, the networks were that heavily congested. So 4G came along to provide that next big step in capacity. And where I described 2G as being voice centric, 3G as being data centric, 4G was really video centric, and 5G is all about things. So of course, each technology does what the previous one did, often better, but they bring that new capability as well. So <clears throat> we also saw a range of new devices and use cases. Uh, the introduction of Advanced communicators like the Nokia E90. Now, the communicator has been around for a long time, of course, uh, but effectively that introduction of uh, HSPA gave it the data capability it needed to really become quite an effective multimedia device. And also the introduction of MiFi devices here as well. So you could now carry a portable Wi Fi hotspot with you and effectively backhaul that connection to the network operator using HSDPA. And of course, that, that particular type of device is now very, very common still with 4G and 5G. So just a few words towards a summary now. <clears throat> We've talked through a lot of technology, 2G, 3G, and how that's evolved to support data services. It's really important that we actually create this record because we've already seen now some 2G networks being switched off. Here's an example from Sunrise in Switzerland. Uh, early January this year, they switched off 2G. <clears throat> Vodafone are in the process of switching 3G off right now in certain towns and cities. EE has announced 3G will go completely in 2024. So <clears throat> we've seen 2G switched off, but the UK is talking about switching 3G off. We're not talking about switching 2G off. That's for a number of reasons. The 2G network today has very limited capacity but it's still the kind of glue that holds the world together. If you're international roaming, then no matter what device you've got, the lowest common denominator is 2G. There are a lot of machine-to-machine -machine modems, devices sold in 2G in the UK, the GPRS and or Edge, capable. The 3G device market didn't take off massively 
because 3G devices, WCDMA devices, were a lot more expensive. So you know, we tended to see 2G dominate that machine-to-machine -machine communication space, and that's been replaced by 4G. So 2G is going to stay around for a while. In the UK, I anticipate it'll be here till at least probably 2028, and potentially some services on some of the networks to 2032. So it's going to be around for a little while, but very, very little capacity, generally just two TRXs, typically on a base station now, at either 900 megahertz or 1800 megahertz. The rest of the spectrum having been repurposed for 4G and 5G typically moving forward. Okay, uh, mentioned before, yeah, I'm tweeting lots of stuff about this kind of thing from 2G underscore GSM. The website is 2G dash GSM. Uh, it wouldn't let me do a dash, I had to do an underscore on Twitter. Um, but yeah, 2G dash GSM.co.uk, uh, where I'm trying to document this stuff as a bit of a hobby in the background and publish various information to make sure that record is available. And that just about sums me up in time, I think, about the hour. Uh, more than happy to take any questions. And thank you very much for your attention. It's great to have such an audience. Cheers. Right. I, I, several things are coming up there, Andy, for me, particularly uh, just how quickly the technology is moving. Some of the things you were talking about that were really amazing and special have just disappeared. Like Completely. Yeah. Remember, PCI MCIA cards. Wow, I remember those. And in fact, the CDs, you know, yeah. and CD, DVD players in, in things as well. It's amazing how quickly they've gone. And you said something early on about high speed. And I remember thinking I've, many times in my career, somebody's come up with something new and improved and high speed. Yeah. And you think you, you, you eventually learn. You don't use that that terminology because in five years time what you call was new and new technology new high this it's just yeah, rubbish it's, it's very slow, slow again so they've gone so very quickly and blackberries as well i mm. agree where did they go what wow. a revolution that was wasn't mm. it just yeah. anyway for um for everybody online and for the people in the room that's it. thank you very much to uh, to andy for yeah, the talk you. it's it's really dragged us back through the last 20 30 years mm. of our lives i think and uh, remembering things that we thought we'd forgotten so thank you very much, Andy. A round of applause in the room. Thank you. Thank you. And from online as well. And uh, we'll we'll stop the recording at that point. We'll try to get the recording uh, top and tailed and get it online before too long. Hopefully, thanks. Thanks very much, everybody. And uh, thank you all. Bye.